All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to the Supervision Committee meeting. Today is August 18th, 2016. The time is 8.43. We are at the Department of Consumer Affairs hearing room in Sacramento. Um, let's go ahead and establish a quorum, please. Good morning. Betty Conley. Here. Dr. Leah Brew. Here. Patricia Locke Dawson. Here. We have a quorum. Great, thank you. Um, and we're gonna, gonna do introductions and I wanna make a note and I'll let um, Angelique Scott introduce herself also, but I wanna acknowledge our new legal counsel who will be supporting the board uh, moving forward, so welcome. Yeah. So um, why don't we start with you, Betty? Betty Connolly, LEP member. Leah Brew, LPCC member and the chair of the committee. Kim Madsen, executive officer for the board. Patricia Lack Dawson, public member. Roseanne Helms, legislative analyst for the board. Christy Berger, regulatory analyst for the board. Angelique Scott, staff counsel, Office of Legal Affairs. Steve Sodergren, assistant executive officer for the board. Great, and how about um, our audience? Are you all willing to introduce yourselves? You'll probably have to turn on those microphones too. They're probably not on yet. They're on? Okay, great. Kurt Woodhelm, licensed marriage and family therapist. Thank you. Heck, Nick, what do you think? Is it okay? It's okay. You can just yell it. <laughs> if I can hear it, I'll be happy. Welcome, yeah. Welcome. So welcome everyone. Thanks for coming. I'm glad you're here. Theoretically, this is our last meeting, even though this is quite a, a lot to go through. Um, all right, so do we have any suggestions for future agenda items? Hearing none, any public comment for items not on the agenda? All right, then we will move forward to update on prior committee decisions and next steps. Thank you. Um, so this, as um, Leah had just mentioned, this is likely our last meeting. And we anticipate that our proposed changes will next go to the Policy and Advocacy Committee uh, coming up at, at the end of September and then presented to the full board at the November 2016 meeting. And then we would run our legislation and regulations during 2017. Um, and we'll talk a little more about timelines when we're looking at the proposed language. Um, so the informal decisions made by the Supervision Committee have been incorporated into the proposed language in the next um, three agenda items. But just to um, kind of summarize what that language does, we're making our supervision provisions consistent among the three professions. Um, there's a proposal to allow supervision of students performing psychotherapy to satisfy the supervisor two-year experience requirement. We're strengthening provisions related to monitoring and evaluating supervisees. Um, we address supervisors being reachable while the supervisee is providing services. We're looking at an initial supervisor training of 15 hours for all professions and then six hours of professional development every two years for supervisors. 
Um, we are going to uh, looking at requiring supervisors to notify the board that they are supervising and to perform a self-assessment of qualifications that they would submit to the board. Uh, we would have the authority to audit supervisors, um, requiring the supervisor to ensure that the amount of group supervision is appropriate to each supervisee's needs, uh, allowing triadic supervision, which is two supervisees with one supervisor in place of individual supervision, and then requiring applicants who have completed their experience hours to continue receiving one hour of supervision per week per work setting. There is one provision that the proposed language does not include as we plan to run it as a separate regulatory proposal, which is um, when you have a supervisor who is either deceased or incapacitated, uh, how you go about um, documenting your experience. So that's just a summary. Um, we'll get into some of the detail here in our next item. Any questions, comments? Okay, so then we'll move on to uh, <clears throat> discussion and possible recommendation regarding proposed supervision language amendments for LMFT. Then we'll do LPCC and LCSWs. Um, so I know there's a lot of overlap on this language, and I, if everyone is okay with this, where we have it in all three areas, if we have any questions or comments, um, can we go ahead and bring it up then? I know we'll start with the MFT. Is that okay if we do it that way? And then when we get to the individual things for each one, we can address those just for efficiency's sake because there's a lot to go through. All right. Um, and maybe we take, I'm not sure whether to take them one at a time <laughs> because there's also some language typo things that needed corrected and But I, but I don't have the corrections in each of these one at a time things. I have it actually because it's electronic. <laughs> <laughs> what I would say is I think that we can, you know, for typos and that type of thing, we can deal with that um, offline um, unless it's making a real substantive change. Um, we had gotten feedback from legal as well on the language that's here today, but had, if I correct me if I'm right, wrong, um, it hasn't been incorporated into the language just yet. Um, staff, we met with staff a few weeks ago and they provided some suggestions. Some of that is incorporated, so this is still an evolving document. So I think what um, we want to focus on today is content. So I have to remember where my content is. Okay, well let's go ahead and just take it one at a time and I'll thumb through and see if I can find the content pieces. Okay. Thank you, Roseanne. Sounds good. Um, so, so yes, we've seen this document um, a few times before at previous meetings, and it's kind of as it evolves. We, as Kim mentioned, we met with our licensing staff and got feedback from them on um, implementation of of the concepts that that you see here today before you. And so, I'm going to kind of go through um, each major change. Um, the areas that are highlighted um, in yellow contain significant changes um, and also you see in the text there's a lot of color coding that will eventually go away um, but the items in green kind of represent um, significant changes since the last meeting in case you were wondering what that what that's all about. Um, so the first item um, that we are proposing for discussion today is we've revised the definitions of intern and applicant. Um, this is because we needed to be able to um, identify somebody who was um, still an applicant, but that they had finished gaining their experience hours. Um, so we have named that particular category of person an applicant for licensure. Um, so we've got a specific definition um, of intern and then applicant for licensure. Um, and so we want to discuss that. Any questions or comments on that? And that's across the professions, correct? That is across the professions. Okay. All right. Let's move on to the next one. Yeah, uh, we oh, we do. Sorry. Can, um, I, unfortunately, you'll have to come forward with your question. I'm sorry to make you get up. <laughs> they will still be called associates. We, we refer in several places in the law to um, 
not only do we refer to associates, but we refer to applicants. Um, those people may or may not be registered as an associate. Um, they might be waiting for their registration, um, or they might be um, working in an exempt setting and in the exam final exam cycle, so they no longer need a registration, um, so they don't keep one, but they're still working in an exempt setting. So that's, that word refers to them. Yeah, we'll have to oh, have, you need to have you speak in, in the, the microphone. microphone. Yeah. It, so uh, it may be helpful for you to know um, at the board meeting tomorrow, there's an agenda item that will be changing the language for all the professions on that. To associate. To associate instead of intern. Okay, anything else? Right. Next item. Okay, the next item has to do with um, employees and volunteers gaining experience um, versus performing services. Um, there was some inconsistency in the law across the professions, and we addressed this last meeting, um, and we had a conversation about how the law states that talks about how interns and trainees may only gain experience as an employee or a volunteer and not as an independent contractor, but there's sort of a difference there between, and there was some inconsistency with when they can perform services. So performing services and then actually gaining experience for it are two different things. So we have proposed um, some language that states um, that no trainees, interns, or applicants are for licensure are allowed to perform service perform services or gain experience within the defined scope of practice of the professions as an independent contractor. Any questions or comments of that? Okay, thank you. Um, the next item just talks about um, supervision via video conferencing and, and adding some language that's um, about HIPAA compliance. Um, we've, there's been no changes to this since the last meeting. So moving on, um, we also have tweaked the definition of supervision. Um, we revised it to be consistent what, with what's already in the law for other license types. For MFT, there were some differences. Um, since the last meeting, we have also made some changes to the definition. Um, we placed an amendment to require that the supervisor must mon monitor for and attend to any counter-transference, intrapsychic, and interpersonal issues that may affect the supervisory or the patient-practitioner relationship, um, and also an amendment to require the supervisor to review the progress notes, process notes, and other tr treatment records, and also um, the amendment states that the supervisor should engage in direct observation or review of audio or video recordings with client written consent as the supervisor deems appropriate. So we, I want to talk about that and then legal also had had some comments about um, some minor language changes so I want to talk about those as well. Um, so if you look at page 18 and 19 in your packet, um, that's where those those amendments are. I'll give you everybody a second. Um, so if you look at page 18, um, under the subheader 4980.43.1, and it's number B4, you'll see that first um, first um, amendment that we we made last meeting. Um, where it says monitoring for and attending to any counter transference issues it goes on from there um, legal suggested that um, the word attending to is a little bit vague and was suggesting that um, we maybe consider using um, monitoring for and resolving or responding to any counter transference issues would either of those work my thought was that resolving has a bit of a different meeting meaning yeah. it's not really concreete if you resolve something so attending to or wait yeah, yeah. Um, responding, responding would to. responding to I don't think that has the same you know you have to be 100% sure addressing yeah. addressing addressing okay. that work Angelique addressing Yes, I think I just put down, I didn't quite understand when I read it from an outsider, under, I didn't understand what attending to meant. 
um, what the actual action was, but I, I do believe that um, that modification, I understand what that means. Okay, okay. thank you. Okay, and then on the next page, page 19, um, right at the top you see um, uh, item number seven. Um, and so we're talking about direct observation or review of audio or videotapes. Um, so there's a suggestion to reword that slightly. Um, and the new, I'll just read what it would say. Or um, Instead of, because the wording's a little awkward, what if we said instead, with the client's written consent, providing direct observation or review of audio or video recordings of therapy as deemed appropriate by the supervisor. Is that okay? It's to me, yeah. Comments? Okay. Say it again. Yes. Um, it would say, with the client's written consent, providing direct observation or review or of audio or video recordings of therapy as deemed appropriate by the supervisor. Okay. Oh, we have a comment. Kurt Whithelm, LMFT. Um, I, I think that in encompassing the technology that's available, I would like to open this up uh, to a little bit even broader to include live supervision, where the supervisor is in the same room or potentially using a video conference um, platform in order to engage the supervisee while they're in the room with the client. That makes sense. Yeah, come, come on. Well, I'd like to echo the comment made by my um, MFT colleague. This is going to be a major challenge for social work. So many of psychotherapeutic and psychotherapy services now are being packaged in terms of schools and wellness clinics and child protective services as a result of the KDA, the young girl who initiated a suit against the city and county of Los Angeles. Um, she was in foster care and um, as a result of that case, Child Protective Services is now mandated to include and provide an integrative platform for mental health services for children who come into foster care. At the same time, we now have Assembly Bill 403, which has been adopted and is mandated to be implemented beginning January 1st, 2017, which has a two-year window for a basically eliminating group homes, not only in Child Protective Services, but also in probation, which means that a large number of children who are presenting with mental health, uh, let's say opportunities for service, are going to be in a community. So there's going to be a huge need for mental health services that are embedded within community agencies. Child Protective Service agencies and a lot of community agencies are, I think, going to be very reluctant to try to involve and incorporate outside supervisors if they have to provide access, whether it's even to hard copy progress notes. There's a legal question in terms of can outside supervisors have access to child protective service court reports and treatment plans? Schools at this point are just in the process of trying to develop some kind of guideline and protocol, not only for information management, but for confidentiality services. So having an outside individual come in and have access not only raises concerns about privacy, but quite frankly, a lot of these systems are overwhelmed and they just don't have the person power to be able to provide some kind of place where someone from the outside, such as myself, because I supervise 
a lot of my students after they graduate, the counties are happy that I do this because I do it in a really cost-effective way, but to invite me in to have access to their court material is really going to be problematic. Can I, can I ask you something yeah. for a moment? Um, so let me ma first make sure I understand the structure. So the students are at an agency. You're an external supervisor to that agency. They're employees in they're, that agency. They're employees in an agency. Mm -hmm. And then um, not that they would see, that not that you're supposed to see all the files, but they have to write case notes, right, about the client. They have to provide the court with a legal rep report. Right. In, child, in, in, each, in each agency, it's a little bit different. In Child Protective Services, they have to investigate, document, and be able to provide information to the judge so that when the judge makes decisions about where the child is to be placed and what the plan is in terms of permanency, that there is some professional documentation. Right. Those are in the custody of the court. Okay. I guess when I'm, I'm the intent behind this is that when a associate is creating case notes on a particular case, who makes sure that they're doing a good job so that the client isn't harmed by their lack of knowledge, by the uh, associate's lack of knowledge? That is an excellent and a loaded question. Okay. Um, as the outside supervisor, I really can encourage, push, provide documentation from the literature, case examples from my own 40 years of practice. How that fits together with the Child Protective Service System, and I don't want to just single them out. I'm pointing out schools, Kaiser, all of these agencies now are utilizing the services of social workers and MFTs. But they're all operating, and this is the, and I've been teaching for 40 years, the major change in the career path of social workers and MFTs is the introduction of the concept of productivity. How do you work on a time clock with someone else's pain and desperation? So to go back to your question, I can tell them in a theoretical world the best way to address termination or resistance or to process counter-transference or intrapsychic complexity. Supervisor in the agency who has someone at a higher managerial level redoing the productivity and may, if I can reference it to Child Protective Services, be looking at the social worker's caseload and say, gee, we're coming up to the 12 month. Under extraordinary circumstances, we can extend this case and supportive services to 18 months. But your caseload is large and we have other cases coming in. So why don't we steer this towards 12 month? Whereas I'm clinically saying, look, I think it's in the best interest of the child to factor in that we're coming to the end of the school year and that provides some continuity relationship-wise until the beginning of the next school year. So that's really advocate for 18 months. I and part I'm getting of the lost training, in the case notes. Question. I'm sorry? I'm getting lost here because I'm looking for the case notes um, part. Who, does anybody so how look this at the often notes? plays out uh -huh. is that the student, the registered associate, writes in the case notes what would be the ideal and makes a recommendation. That then is reviewed by the agency supervisor who makes a recommendation and steers it towards the court. So, so my, well, reviewing, I, my reviewing the case notes uh -huh. is something they wouldn't allow me to do. Sure. Uh, does somebody look at the case notes? Does any, because here's what's, what I'm um, sitting on the board. Mm -hmm. I've uh, many disciplinary cases it happens in disciplinary cases where poor keeping of case notes either harms the licensee or registrant um, 
or it harms the client in some way because those case notes were not done well, they're sketchy, they're poorly written, um, or not done at all. A lot of times, like, people don't keep case notes. Who is responsible for making sure that that's done well with someone who's under supervision? There's two answers. Okay. From the agency's perspective, it's the supervisor uh -huh. and the officers of the court. They're reviewing it from the specific provisions in the penal code and in the uh, welfare and institutions code. That's one answer. Second answer. When I meet with that student, I'm sorry, that registered associate, and just as I gave you the example of whether it's 12 months and they want to close the case in May, and I'm processing with my supervisee, I really think we should recommend 18 months, and let's make the strongest case that we can. And I'm going to ask that we think about a diplomatic way of communicating this to the court so that I'm not jeopardizing your job. That's the second answer. Okay, so no one is looking at the case note before it goes to court. So if the case notes are co poorly kept and a case comes up, there, a complaint comes up, then that person has no one who's been supervising them on how to write good case notes. On the contrary. Okay, good. <laughs> it's reviewed initially when I'm meeting with the registered associate in terms of what's your thinking clinically What's your thinking in terms of how to communicate this to your supervisor who's under pressure in terms of productivity? And what's your sense of how to package this in terms of higher level management and the specific judges the case are going to come be before? So you're giving advice so it's on multiple, how to I'm giving multiple levels of supervisory review. Right. Because one of the major components in the um, current language that applies to s social work is the emphasis on advocacy as well as clinical thinking. Sure. And oftentimes registered associates, whether it be in child protective services or they have to or in schools or even in medical settings, have to basically be multilingual and the languages that I'm referring to is not only clinical and developmental interests of the consumer, but also the language and priorities of the agency, and how to basically outsmart the productivity thinking. Right. So um, it's not that you're not giving direction on how to do those actual case notes, but here's what makes me very nervous about taking this provision out, that somebody needs to look at them. Um, I hate to admit that this has happened at my university. I'm a professor also. Mm -hmm. And we have had students who've gotten fired from their agency because they didn't write any case notes. They're like, oh, I'm going to get to that. I'm going to get to that. And suddenly they're a month behind. And who is gonna pr who's going to oversee to make sure that that doesn't happen? If the supervisor, I don't mind if it's the agency is responsible for reviewing those case notes, has the knowledge that of how those notes should be written. Um, but my guess is they hire an external person to supervise because they don't understand the clinical pieces. So there's just no one. So this it could go to court and it could be written very poorly and it would be simply the supervisee's ignorance, lack of knowledge, and there's no one to protect that supervisee from getting in Big, big trouble, right? Well, the way things are done currently is that individuals written work is reviewed on a weekly basis. By whom? By the agency supervisor. That's part of the that's part of the productivity man. I can't speak I, I'm in Northern California. I can't speak for other areas. Okay. And uh, I agree but that supervisor I think are looking at it then. I, I yeah. But they're looking at it largely from the agency's perspective. Do they have clinical knowledge? How honest do you want me to be? Okay, well, thank you. I, okay, I think, but, I think but, where we get into but, is you know the the supervisor supervisee relationship and 
And then I think what I'm hearing from you is that there's a very different application in the real world. And you know what we're trying to do here is set up a best practice standard. And much like our laws, we can put the laws out there, here's how you practice safely, ethically, professionally, and invariably somebody's gonna tweak it or deviate, and the, these would be, I think, what we're trying to lay out is this would be the bare minimum to have a, a safe and ethical practice. And perhaps for situations like the CPS, for the example you brought up, maybe it's more of an educational component about what it is we're seeking in terms of how we prepare these folks for full licensure. Um, and, and that's, you know, we can do that between the different agencies and hopefully the professions can advocate for that. But I, the one thing I'm not, I, I don't know, and maybe I've missed it, but you said it was gonna be a problem. So to me, in, it, in listening to the exchange with Dr. Brew, it, it sounds to me like there is some level of oversight but I didn't hear what the problem might be. Well, I'll, I'll discuss the problem in just one minute, Kim. I'm not suggesting that this be eliminated. My suggestion would be to incorporate the specific language into the agreement between the outside oh. super. Yeah, okay. And that way to individualize. Yeah. Now, the problem. <laughs> These agencies right now are overwhelmed. The implementation of that group home elimination, counties don't know what to do. They're scrambling just to be able to keep their head above water. Very honestly, they're not prioritizing how to support professional development of their staff. So how on the one hand to make it easiest for them to have a best practice standard that protects the constituency. Okay. Because again, as a social worker, I'm always thinking about how to, if you'll forgive me, outsmart the system. And just to give you a sense of how I think this wave of new consumers, it may very well be that fairly soon the board may be asked to have a community member who's gone through the foster care system. And mental health is now being packaged not as mental health, but as integrative behavioral services. So there's a real reconfiguration of the very zone you want to protect. And, and my only comments today have to do with those sections in yellow, the changes. I really strongly support triadic supervision. I think that's terrific. I support the 3,000 hours. Looking ahead, and again, next wave, Self-care, some kind of training along the way. Self-care, all the systems now are going trauma-informed, neurobiology, somehow to incorporate that in the consumer requirements that you're looking towards. The only other minor point, and if you want me to come back to this later, I can, is the designation that you have for the supervisory review the uh, outside uh, academy that you've designated. I'm not familiar with them. Uh, I looked at their website. They don't have a California board member. It seems to me that having someone, a voice, some vehicle that is grounded in all this complexity that I'm, again, forgive me, dumping on you. <laughs> but that's the way that it is. Enrollment in social work schools keeps going up, but it's more and more complicated out there in terms of how to do really good practice when we're operating in a productivity operated cost effectiveness environment. And that's just a harsh reality. So how do we outsmart it in a collaborative way? Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I guess to sum up, um, to add that in the supervision agreement, it would yeah, it's already in there. Okay. Yeah, uh, we'll get to it later, but yep. in the forms it says I understand that I am responsible for. Okay. So. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we have another comment. Please come up. 
Mick Rogers. I'm an LCSW. I've been a since about 1980. Um, I got a lot of concerns about how agencies, and not just big agencies like child foster care agencies, but teeny tiny agencies have been impacted by the Great Recession. And one of the ways they've been impacted is they don't provide clinical supervision anymore. Um, I have, I'm a unique social worker because I have my LCSW and an MBA. I'm, I'm the guy that pushes the productivity because that, that's what pays the bills. And if you can't pay the bills, you close your agency. But I want to provide a high quality service, which means I want in-house supervisors, people I really know and I really trust. Sadly, we've moved away from that. Um, little, um, in Yolo County, we have the um, uh, Sexual Assault and Domestic Violence Center. We used to have a great clinical supervisor there. We don't have one anymore. We now contract out. Uh, other agencies now are telling people that are ASWs, we're hiring you, we don't provide supervision, we don't even provide time off to go to your supervisor, it's up to you to get your supervision. I think one thing, anything the BBS could do to support clinical supervisors in being real true clinical supervisors and not people that just sign off on hours or sign off on progress notes would be really helpful. And uh, one very specific thing that's related directly to this issue that we're talking about would be the contract that you're supposed to sign when you're an outside supervisor. Um, it'd be great to have, I mean, if you're, if you're working in small private practice and you do three hours a week of clinical supervision, you're not going to hire a lawyer to create a contract for you. It'd be very helpful to have it on the website. This is a model contract. Thank and you. in this model contract, it makes it painfully clear, I, the clinical supervisor, am responsible for the clinical social, social work associate's work. And in order to do that, I need access to their records. And if you want me in this role, if you the CEO of your CPS agency or your little tiny uh, battered women's shelter want me to take that level of responsibility, you need to allow me in to get that access. And you need to allow me in to get audio tapes and video tapes of um, sessions and process recordings. And, and I'm responsible, so I, I, I'm driving the bus here. Otherwise, I can't, I can't be responsible if I'm not driving the bus. So anything you do that supports the, the supervisors, the environment of being a clinical supervisor is much different than it was when I used to do it back in the 80s and the 90s. It used to be one of the most respected roles in an agency. If you were the clinical supervisor, it meant you were the one chosen to take care of the newbies. <laughs> and you were going to grow them up strong and straight to represent the agency and to protect those consumers out there. Nowadays, it's like we can't afford that. I I'm shocked this is the first thing they got rid of. It's the first thing they got rid of. So anything you can do in this process to make it uh, stronger. And I, I don't know how we're doing this today, but I disagree on the issue of triadic supervision. That's really why I'm here today. So I'll wait to talk about that to a later time. Thank you. Um, but I really want to strongly emphasize the world out there is different for clinical supervisors. Agencies, it, since the Great Recession, are trying to save money above all else, even above providing quality care to their clients. And therefore, they're allowing outside uh, supervisors to just sort of sign off on hours and to rubber stamp progress notes without really having the time to review them. Um, in my career, <laughs> I've read so many progress notes, it's unbelievable. And I'm glad I did, because that's usually where I found out there's something missing here. This is a case that I need to ask, uh, can I have an audio tape or a videotape or a process recording? Can, um, or maybe even join you in the session or watch behind the one-way mirror. And it has to be timely. I mean, you're right. If, if, <laughs> if an intern or an associate or whatever you want to call them isn't doing their progress notes, then that's, they're floundering and they're lost. They're not integrating theory into practice. Uh, and if they are and they're sharing stuff, often they share it in what I call the white space. The white space meaning it's what's missing. It's like, why is this missing? And it's often counter-transference and projective identification and enactments that by their very nature are unconscious processes. So they're totally unaware of them. And it's our role as the clinical supervisor to have that distance and carefully and sort of lovingly help them see there's a, there's a white space here. We can work on this together. I'm really concerned that the Great Recession has hurt the uh, ability to create psychotherapists in this state. Because it's usually through nonprofit agencies that that happens, and they've just decided to make this the lowest of all priorities.
Thank you so much. Yeah, I think the idea of a model contract is great. And thank you for your comments. Shall we move forward? Going back to the gentleman that commented first, he had um, made a point about possibly incorporating live recordings in as well, if that was my understanding. Live uh, supervision. Uh -huh. um, so do we want to say something like um, where it says review of audio or video recordings of therapy? Do we want to say something like recordings or live feeds or live transmissions? Or was that, is that what you were looking for? I think if you just include um, the amount of direct or live supervision, that's sufficient to my concern. Direct or live observation? Okay. What? Er, okay, so direct doesn't mean it's not live, though. <laughs> For my clarification, are you thinking, uh, what's your idea that you sat in on the session um, physically so that if I'm the client, I see two people there? Okay. So um, I don't know how that isn't direct. Yeah, my understanding of direct is live. Mm -hmm. Yeah, whether, whether it's behind a two-way mirror or in person. I'm either behind a one-way mirror or I'm in the room with I them. I think it goes better where we were talking about the review or audio or video recordings. The recording to me is not live. And I think that if we said recordings are live feeds or, or live transmissions. Well, no, it's not a transmission because you're actually in the room. I actually, um, when I was doing some research preparing for this committee, there is now with technology um, the ability for the supervisor to listen in and be giving feedback through um, like digitally yeah. to oh. help guide the supervisee in responding to the client what the client's saying so that was the live real supervision time. can be yeah it's like real, real time, time. Mm -hmm. it's one-way mirror supervision through video conference yeah so I don't know how but that it's live it is I still think it's, still it's direct observation yeah yeah <laughs> I mean I think what regardless of Direct observation means you're watching the session, whether it's through a one-way mirror, through a camera, or in the room. I don't see those as being different from live. Could we change direct to live and call it live observation? I, I don't understand the need to differentiate between that at all. Direct observation is direct observation regardless of what method you use. Hurt's changing his mind. He's I, finding Dwight's observation is okay. It's <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, can I ask a question? Darlene Davis, Hope Counseling Center. Um, under six reviewing progress notes, process notes, and other treatment records, I remember at one of the prior meetings, the intent is not that you have to do read every single progress note every single time, is Correct. it? Correct. No, okay. that is not the intent. Okay. <laughs> Page 19. <laughs> yeah. I had actually meant to add this earlier, and I'm glad <laughs> I'm glad that came up because I'm trying to reflect back on what the um, what the agency's challenge with some of this, and trying to um, understand the the implications in terms of not wanting to make it so difficult that they don't. Uh, can, am I not talking to the mic here? You're good. Um, I don't want to. I, I think what what the concern was that we don't want to make it so cumbersome or so difficult that agencies no longer are willing to engage in that. And at the same time, I really feel strongly about the need to maintain the integrity of the process. So I'm just wondering whether getting at that question as well, if we on number six if we did the same thing as we did on number seven, where it said reviewing progress note, process notes, and other treatment records as deemed appropriate by the supervisor, would that add anything or is that superfluous? Because then if it is something internally that's an agency, I mean, then that gives the supervisor some leeway to possibly navigate um, some of those challenges. I, I don't know, that, that was just the thought. 
and and that kind of got to to the does that mean every single note well no as as the, the super I think that provides some clarity to the whether it's every single note or not yeah yeah I think so too Here, Diane Diane I have, <coughs> I have a quick question <coughs> or maybe a suggestion on number seven how about if you um, replace the word direct with real time? Sure. No. <laughs> but but it says or, it says or review of audio. So, yeah. so here you're contemplating both. Yeah, I guess I, I think, I think it doesn't direct encompass that I mean it's not exclusive of real time so why would you need to clarify that it's it's all inclusive the, the reason I'm in, I like direct observation is it's broader and more vague mm -hmm. <laughs> so it allows for more inclusion of whatever could happen in the future that we can't anticipate yet And then to get back to Betty's point, um, adding the phrase as deemed appropriate by the supervisor yes. to item number six. Okay. Any comments from the audience? Okay. No? I think we're good with, with adding that. Thank you, Betty. Hey, going back to, let me find my place here. Number uh, were we on? <laughs> we were on. We're we just finished number three, so we're number four. Okay. Um, handling crises, crises and emergencies. Um, we discussed this last last meeting. Um, we decided to um, adopt um, some wording from the American Counseling Association's ethical code, um, requiring supervisors to develop a a, a procedure for um, contacting the supervisor in a crisis. Any comments? No. Okay. All right, number five, uh, required supervisory experience. Um, this is the requirement we discussed in the past several meetings um, as well. Um, currently, the, in order to supervise or register, a supervisor must have practiced psychotherapy or provided direct supervision for two of the past five years. Um, we clarified that supervision of LPCC trainees or social work students also can count um, towards this this requirement of two of the past five years if the um, if the supervision is um, equivalent to what it would be for an intern or associate. Questions, comments. All right, number six. Number six. Um, just a clarification that. Um, oh. oh wait. Rebecca Gonzalez, NASW. I just had a question. Social work students, you're referring to MSW students? I, it's just not a term we usually use. It's worded as, let me look it up here. Social work students, it says supervision of social work students enrolled in an accredited master's or doctoral program or LPCC trainees. Okay. Who, as long as this, um, it's the, the supervision is substantially equivalent to the supervision required for registrants. Okay, thank you. Right, number six. Yes, number six. Um, this was just an amendment we discussed previously, previously um, clarifying that um, supervisor, one of the requirements for supervisors, they've been licensed for at least two years. Um, in California, we also clarified that, it, or if they hold an equivalent license in any other state, that that qualifies. Any questions? Oh. All right, seven. Okay, required training and coursework for supervisors. Christy mentioned earlier that we're requiring a one uh, time 15 hour supervision course. Um, any supervisor who is not supervised in two of the last five years must retake a six hour one time course. Um, we also list, we also um, formulated a 
a list of activities. We basically are saying that supervisors every renewal period must complete six hours of continuing professional development. Um, and we list some, some activities that qualify as that. Um, we made an amendment um, after last discussion last meeting that all of these activities must be documented. Um, legal had a question though, and I'm gonna refer you to page 35. Um, and I think this is a, is a good point. Um, on page 35, item C, you'll see item C at the top of the page and then subsection three, which talks about authoring research pertaining to supervision that has been published professionally. Um, and the, the question from legal was, what does it mean to be published professionally? Is there, is there a little bit of further clarification that we could make there? We, we, ha we hashed over this already a lot. Um, and I don't think there's a way to be precise and also um, broad. broad. Yeah, I, I, because in my mind, I'm thinking um, legitimate journals that are, you know, blind, not blind reviewed necessarily, but that are, are, are reviewed or through books that are published through legitimate I mean I think that's something that's going to have to be left to the board of the board's the discretion, discretion. Uh, there's just no way to make it but we don't want to take it off because doing that research could be way more fruitful than doing a six-hour CEU and yet um, you know if somebody does something super fluffy and puts it in a newsletter then that's yeah, I mean, also some something in a newsletter could be legitimate too. So you can't where it's authored doesn't demonstrate the rigor of it. Um, but research is a very specific word. Mm -hmm. That's true. So maybe that's where your measure comes in. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think we can leave it from here right now. I think maybe we could go back and suggest additional language, such as, as you said, um, legitimate journal, nationally recognized, uh, scientifically accepted. I think there should be some criteria, or you can leave it at just how, how it is. I think it's just ex extremely vague. Then I guess you're going to leave it to the staff to decide whether or not um, they determine Maybe there's a way to qualify the word research a little more like. I think if I recall the very extensive conversation around yes. this, I, I think we were trying to recognize, as you said, that, that it didn't have to be a peer reviewed, you know, kind of level, but we were trying to rule out people who self published. Wasn't that? Well, not necessarily self-published, but who, for example, do a blog and publish it in a way that looks like it's research. Okay. <laughs> I can't see us accepting a blog. <laughs> I, I'm just or a journal. Or a journal. Or, my or, thoughts or on. Yeah. But why, why didn't you put, um, then, why don't you restrict it to peer-reviewed journals, whether online or whatever? I mean, peer-reviewed journals and books. Well, I don't know that... It, it, because sometimes they can show up in other types of documents that are legitimate. Monograms, or monographs, sorry, monographs. Um, but those even are newsletters still, can be. Monographs are still peer-reviewed in a way. I mean, they, won't, they don't get published as a monograph unless they've been reviewed. So. Or newsletters, where there's one editor who might review it. But you don't. But you think some of those are legitimate than the newsletters you don't it could be because i've done research for, with the intention of publishing it in counseling today which is just an, an mm -hmm. you know like the little newsletter kind of thing that we get every month it's more like a magazine now but um but that was the purpose of it was to inform the profession the professional practitioners who don't necessarily read journal articles and you can only publish it in one place you can't publish it in more than one so the location of the publication doesn't measure the legitimacy. It's like the quality of the work. So should, I mean, should we just qualify it with something like at the discretion of the board or? 
Well, it's I think accepted. that's that's always implied, isn't implied? it? I don't know. Is <laughs> it? I don't know. Sometimes. Thanks. So I'm just going to sit here today and just be the devil's advocate. The problem with this is you are leaving way too much to the discretion of the staff. So to the extent that you can provide um, somehow limit it in a way that makes their job easier, that, that helps with uniformity on what gets in and what does not get in. So, you know, that's why this is important. So I think we had before put quantitative and qualitative research, but I don't remember why someone, I think it was Ben who thought of a reason that something could be very legitimate research that didn't fit in those. Yeah. I've just been taking notes on things that you've offered and things that, um, or d different publications that you can consider adding in and maybe what you can actually consider excluding. Um, legitimate journals, um, peer-reviewed, um, monographs, newsletters, um, quantitative, qualitative, and if you want to exclude blogs, you know, maybe- Or personal even, opinion papers. Or, or, or personal opinion papers. <laughs> I think with a starting point, and then you have some type of criteria um, yeah. To actually start off with, I would have looked into it more. I thought maybe I was going to actually meet with um, s s staff about this before. So real quick, I've been trying to type up um, on my phone specific language, but I think even just right now, you started off with very good criteria to consider. Um, we can, we can work with um, Angelique and craft some language so that when this is prevented, presented to P&A, it, it'll be a little more um, subjective. Robust, yeah. yeah, robust, yeah, because I, Diane makes a really good point. Um, when it's too broad, then yeah. it, 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 it reminds me of the research. CE mess all over <laughs> again, and I, that's icky. So, um, yeah. Okay, good point. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think um, peer review and demonstrable contribution to the professional nature of supervision. And then as examples anchored in the KSAs, the knowledge and skill areas that are complementary with the development of the examination so that you'll have some objective external anchor for the criteria you're establishing. He's talking about what, when they derive the exam plan, what the knowledge and the skills are needed, the KSAs. So that when you develop the exam, every question has to tie back to one of those categories. I may have come up here too early. I actually have a concern about the uh, supervision course that's mentioned in the memo under the same thing, but I don't want to detract from okay. the conversation. So do you think you have enough, Angelique, to get started on languaging that piece? I think we do. Okay. All right. So, yeah. Um, you need to come up. I'm sorry. Just in terms of the, when you were listing qualitative and quantitative research, Yeah, start, uh, give us your name again in the microphone, I think, please. I would just add literature reviews. Literature reviews, yes. That would in definitely be included. Thank you. All right, Kurt. On the memo and in the um, proposed legislation, I just want to make sure that um, the 15 contact hours for supervision that this is not one specific course, but an accumulation of 15 on, uh, continuing education units and supervision that would address these areas? Or is the intent of this to have a set 15 hour course that does address all of these? It, it doesn't say that it has to be a set 15 hour course, so there's some discretion there. They could, they could pick up the content through a couple of Several courses, courses yeah. um, they would just need to be able to show if if they were asked that they that they had all of those content areas. Thank you.
Jeffrey Liebert, AMFT California. Um, I had a comment more on the, the last highlighted section in that category of um, the phase-in period, for lack of better words. And I can you speak up a little bit? I can barely hear you. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I apologize. Thank you. Um, so I'm speaking uh, to the last highlighted section in on number seven, the uh, the first start time of January 1st, 2019. And I'm curious if there's a way to organize kind of a phase in period for those that are already supervising. So that way, 20 years down the line, we don't have people under two different structures. Um, I, we weren't planning to require it for existing supervisors, the 15 hours, because they've already received, they've already been through their supervision training that was in place when they began supervising. They would have to do this. They would have to do the six-hour continuing professional development going forward. Okay. Um, but yeah, they because we're kind of starting off where people have been following the requirements for supervisors. We didn't put in a requirement that would make them go back and retake a fifteen-hour course. Okay. So is the assumption that this six-hour course then will kind of level the playing field after a year or so? I think so. Thank you very much. Thanks. Nick Rogers, I serve on the Law and Ethics Committee of the California Society for Clinical Social Work. And um, we have been interpreting and fairly strongly telling our membership that the 15 hour requirement ethically was a one shot class, not three six hour classes, where you just, or never an online class, or never a read something and fill out a form. This is a, a, a really important change in your identity as a clinical social work supervisor. So therefore, it should be something that really is an intense, uh, more intense than just showing up or more intense than just going to something online. Um, I really encourage the board to consider that if everybody now is going to be required to have the 15 hour class, it'd be nice if it, the way the law was originally written was vague. And we, we just looked at it as ethically, just taking a bunch of little classes isn't the same as really dedicating yourself um, to taking a solid class where you're really developing, do you really want to be a clinical social worker? Do you really want to, a supervisor, do you really want to take on this level of responsibility? Because uh, a lot of these classes don't focus on that. They focus on very specific things. You could take three six-hour classes on supervision and none of them would go, you know, really emphasize strongly, you are taking responsibility for the psychotherapy that your associate is providing. Um, so I really strongly emphasize that across all the professions that the 15 hour class be a 15 hour class and not a three hours here and go online and get four hours there and you know get a six hour thing here and get that thing in the mail that you read through and you already know the answers so you just log on and answer the questions that's not the kind of clinical social workers i want to see i mean that's not the kind of supervisors i want to see in california i totally understand what you're saying i, I would um offer that because of the revisions to our continuing education program and the you know limiting of those broad applications folks are really having to go to more specific entities to get their continuing education in their classes right. um, and so I think because we've changed the CE program we've sort of eliminated the fly-by-night online components I know they're still out there. I know they're still marketing. Right. But if we were to audit and that entity was not associated with one of the approval agencies that we've designated or with one of the professional associations that we've designated as a CE provider, we would not accept that. Well, and, and I understand that they're yeah. going to do it anyway. But Well, even if you showed up to three face-to-face -face mm -hmm. presentations, you could be trained on how to supervise people to do manualized CBT how to do manualized DBT and to do manualized some other alphabet soup thing and never really learn what the role of a clinical social worker is or, or the role of a clinical social work supervisor is. And that to me is the essential reason why we have the 15 hour class. That you're, you're going through a change in role. Yesterday you were a clinical social worker, today you're beginning to be a clinical social work supervisor. And I think that's a huge change in role and that needs to be respected in in the board's decision. 
No, I agree. I, yeah, I, I feel torn about this, quite honestly, because I want it to be a one fifteen hour class. But um, so I took a, a three unit semester class in my doctoral program, and when I did, got licensed here and decided to supervise and was qualified to finally supervise, um, I uh, looked for a six hour supervision course. <laughs> And uh, it was really hard to find something legitimate and decent. And so my hesitation is, I don't know, if, if I knew there were courses out there that were in 2019 that were available and affordable and um, accessible, then I would say, yes, let's make it a 15-hour course. But my hesitation is, I can't even find a legitimate good six-hour course easily. Um, uh, I, I couldn't find any in-person courses I searched for three months well I think what we could you know one of the approaches that we could take is um, leave it broad for right now it's sort of at the discretion and as this phases in and a few years down the road if we see that there is an issue and the market really hasn't responded then come back at that time and and discuss whether we really want to mandate that it's just a 15-hour course could we put um, shall obtain 15 contact hours in supervision or train work, comma, preferably in one course? <laughs> no? Okay. I'm not sure that would fly with ledge right. council. <laughs> it's my fantasy. All right. <laughs> I understand. I understand. Your, but yeah, just the way that they logistically write yeah, things, I can really see them hard. kicking that right out. <laughs> it's not legally easy, yeah. yeah. I get well, that. and here's a nice opportunity for the professional associations at their conferences. I mean, people go there to get CE anyway. If you're having a one or a two day conference, you know, stack it or fill it with supervision, of course, and, and provide that. I mean, I think that's an opportunity that's there if they want to take advantage of it. Olivia? Uh, Olivia Lowy, AMFT California. Uh, I want to voice our agreement with sticking to a 15-hour comprehensive continuing training experience. Um, and I think that if you, if you build it that way, we'll come. <laughs> you, you will get good 15-hour uh, courses that are developed, whether it is as a, at a conference um, or in some other way, will make it happen. Thank you. Dean? Uh, Dean Porter, California Association for LPCCs. I would concur. It was my assumption that's what we meant all along when we instituted the 15-hour course. Uh, I've gotten the question, we have new supervisors coming on with, since we're a new license. Where is the six hour course that we take when we're first going to become a supervisor? And I've looked and had the same experience that Leah did. Uh, so I think there's a need there, not just any six hours about supervision. It, we need from the beginning to the end. You're, you're going to be a supervisor. Uh, let's let's learn about that. And if this isn't implemented until 2019, there's time to get those courses developed. Thank you, Dean. Kurt? I have a, a few points. One is, um, and I, I should express my, that I do teach supervision courses, so I may have a, a bias in this. Um, I, I think that, number one, a lot of agencies who look for licensees who are at that two-year mark, if the CEUs are being placed upon the licensee, um, 15 hours is a big commitment in order to uh, determine that they actually do want to supervise, that this may be something that is addressed through six hours and then maybe a subsequent nine-hour course to fill that out. Um, but a 15 CEU commitment can be hundreds, if not thousands of dollars, depending on the delivery system. Second, uh, a program like the Camp Certified Supervisors is three six-hour courses. And through all of the other work that we've done, we've determined that this is adequate to meet the supervision requirements. Thank you. We have good arguments on both sides of the aisle. <laughs> I, 
I think it's just going to come down to the committee and essentially the board's preference, whether we want to make it a single program or, or leave it where you can piece it together. Jerry Shapiro, San Francisco State. Um, <clears throat> this triggers for me a number of, of ideas and opportunities. I think the 15 unit or 15 hour commitment, sorry. 15 minute, wow. Um, <laughs> certainly strengthens me going to large agencies that we were talking about earlier and really establishing with them a reference point of credibility in terms of what a commitment this is. And I also had the idea that it might give the board, uh, maybe the educational committee component of the board, some opportunity to put together segments to could be standardized across the professions and incorporated as part of that training module so that all of us providing these incredibly important services will be on the same page. And I think it's within that 15 hours where there's really opportunity to develop the nuances of case logs and how to record and that you really establish the standard. It isn't simply a matter of going in and getting certified. It almost made me think about there being some required internship that would be a component of becoming the kind of supervisor th that I think the board is looking for. So um, educationally, I certainly would like to work with different organizations in the board to see what we can do to expand this. So I'd really support 15, 15 hours. Thank you. Kirk, can I ask you something? Can you come up again? I'm sorry. You had said something about having um, three different courses that already exist. Do they build on each other? Are they meant as a single unit overall, like you can, but you can take them at any point in time? or? The, I'm a CAMP certified supervisor, so the three courses, one dealt with the internal structures of supervision, one dealt with the external structures of supervision, and the third dealt with laws and ethics. Um, independently, each of those could stand on their own to meet the six-hour requirements that are currently in place. And I do believe, from my experience as a consumer, that six hours isn't enough to become an initial supervisor. I'm not disagreeing with the 15 hours whatsoever. Um, but I do believe that to make it easy for consumers, um, two days is a big commitment. If it's um, either doing things on a weekend or having to take time off from work in order to do this, um, they don't necessarily build on each other in, in its current structure, but they're A plus quality um, supervision courses. In your fantasy world. <laughs> Wouldn't you prefer that they have the three courses before they start supervising than just one? In my fantasy world, they take all those courses from me, but... <laughs> 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 yes, of course. No. no. Um, okay. Because I think that much like the development of a pre-licensee, there is issues that come up that you don't start to experience until you are in the room supervising okay. that could then be better addressed um, in, a, in a subsequent course. Thank you, that's helpful. Darlene? Hi, Darlene Davis, Hope Counseling Center. Um, I agree that I believe uh, CAMP, I'm also a CAMP certified supervisor and went through the three six hour courses and then a year of supervision of supervision. Um, being supervised. There is a, a benefit to having three different courses. Um, I just did a 12 hour, two day course for the law and ethics for the interns and in, that may not have passed their exam. And it's exhausting by the end of 12 hours. So how much did they really absorb in two days versus I'm gonna do six hours this week and six hours next month and six hours you know, whether it's two weeks apart or two months apart. There's also some experience that you go back and you're doing your work and you're thinking about what you just learned and applying that so that when you go and do the second course, it makes more sense. I don't, I'd rather do that, plus the time and the money. 
I um, think the challenge is, though, it, don't they have to have this course completed within yes. 60 days of the onset of supervision, right? Yes. So if they don't start the coursework, I guess it still gives them two months to take the right. courses as opposed to trying to do it in one right. weekend. And even if they're yeah. not supervising and they're still a therapist yeah. or a clinician, they're thinking differently now. They're think, starting to begin to think as a supervisor. Oh, how would I handle this if this came up with my supervisee as a clinician after taking those courses? So I don't think you have to definitely. But I would also um, invite someday that we have an internship because I have supervised, I mean, I have um, licensed people that still work for me, and I'm like waiting for that two-year mark. Right. <laughs> um, they're, they're so good, and I would love to have them internship, and, and they would, they're telling me they want something to practice and, mm -hmm. and feel good about before they're out there on their own. So, thank you. Olivia Lowy, AMFT, California. <laughs> Um, the AMFT approved supervisor course is 30 hours and it's usually two weekends um, and people make a commitment to do that. They come and they, they write a paper in between and they come back and they're required to do a, a mentorship so it, it is uh, something that is much more comprehensive and a bigger commitment than we're talking about here. Um, even if we were to say do the 15 hours in one course, um, I think that there, what, what I'm, some of what we do is we bring in, um, during that time, because we have the time, we bring in uh, interns, we do vignettes, we have actual supervision sessions that uh, the participants are able to view and talk about. There's also a building of a camaraderie there's a, a little community of new supervisors that develops within that time because they are together, because they do have a, a time to have discussions. Uh, and ongoing consult is something that they sometimes do with each other. So I, I think there are a lot of benefits to having something that's continuous and ongoing, uh, and that it is a big commitment to be a supervisor. And it's very different from being a therapist, really different skills. Uh, and I would just encourage that this is done in one block training format. Thank you. I, I think we've heard good arguments on both sides, and I'm kind of eager to move on because we have a lot more left on our agenda and two more hours to get it all done. Um, I'd like to suggest for right now we um, just stick with the current language and consider later on making that a single course, but for right now, for reasons that a lot of people listed, um, is that okay with the board? Okay. Um, I'm also wondering if we need to take a little 10-minute break. Do we need it? Yeah, let's take a 10 minute break in just 10 minutes, please. Because um, as I said, we do have a lot of agenda items still left to go through. And just logistically, the bathrooms on the first floor for the women um, are not available, but you can go up to the second or the third floor. All right, uh, let's go ahead and reconvene and continue on. Um, again, I want to reiterate, we have a lot of items to discuss, a lot of agenda items. I know there's a lot of overlap, so some of this is great because we're hitting multiple professions at once. Um, but I really want to uh, emphasize efficiency of language. <laughs> to make sure that we can get through the full agenda by noon because we do have another meeting at one o'clock and I really want to eat lunch. <laughs> <laughs>
All right, let's uh, continue then on to number eight, right? Is that where we are? Yes. yes. Number number eight, we'll just move through um, quickly. Um, we've discussed this already. Um, we're changing the term client contact to direct clinic clinical counseling for consistency across the professions. Um, and so that change has already been made and discussed. Um, agenda item number nine, um, the amount of direct supervisor contact required for applicants finished gaining experience hours. We've been tweaking that, that language um, over the past several meetings and we've tweaked it again. Um, we needed, uh, needed to find a way to clarify um, how much direct supervisor contact um, an intern needs once he or she has finished gaining experience hours. Um, the law was silent on that issue. Um, the committee believes that they should at least have one hour of supervision, supervisor contact per week, even if they're done gaining hours. Um, so we've clarified that um, interns and applicants who have finished gaining experience hours need one hour of supervision per week. Uh, once the, the, and we also have some language saying once the hours are gained, supervision for non-clinical practices at the supervisor's discretion. So we've added that in since last meeting. Any questions or comments? Okay, good. Um, item number 10, um, we've split section 4980.43. This is not really um, anything new at all. We've, we're consolidating. Uh, we had a big giant section. We've split that into more manageable sections. So that's been done. Item number 11 um, is something we've discussed in previous meetings. Um, we are including triadic supervision in the definition of supervision, supervisor contact. Um, was it Jerry or was it, it was Nick, Nick uh, who had a comment about that? Yeah. So I did a literature review on triadic supervision, and what I found is triadic supervision adds a lot to the um, in associates learning, but it's within the matrix of what group supervision provides. So there's a lot of skill learning that happens. There's a lot of watching your supervisor present their own cases. What doesn't happen in triadic supervision and that well in group supervision, it, as it does in individual supervision, is people being able to learn how to be self-aware, to look at their own cases and say, I think I have counter-transference and this is the reason why. Um, for that reason, I don't think it's reasonable to allow triadic supervision to replace individual supervision. I think it's a great form of supervision and I think it could replace group supervision. But I am very concerned that agencies post Great Recession are gonna look at this and say, we no longer provide individual supervision. Now all the individual supervision is triadic, and if you work in our agency, you now aren't given enough time to supervise the people you're responsible for. You now put two people in the room at the same time and just be more efficient. Um, I'm really concerned that's gonna pr provide a, a large negative impact on the development of professional clinical social workers and the other uh, master's level psychotherapists in the community. So I think triadic supervision is useful. I have a handout here of um, the three quotes that I thought were really the most instructive on these points. Um, people in triadic supervision are less likely to bring in their, their video conference, their video, videotapes or audio tapes because they just don't want to show it in front of somebody other than their supervisor, just like group supervision. Um, they don't learn the same stuff that they learn in individual, individual supervision. In the matrix of what you learn, they learn more the kind of stuff you learn in group supervision. So given that most, um, you know, that the BBS and Medi-Cal and stuff requires that there be an hour of one-to-one -one and then, you know, most agencies give two hours a group um, for people that are seeing more than 10 clients a week, which is everybody, our time. Um, I, I would prefer that it be allowed to replace the group supervision. Uh, it's not just me. The California Society for Clinical Social Work would like it to be able for social workers to replace group supervision, not individual supervision. About my, what I found in the literature. Thank you. Okay, this is going to sound really like I haven't been around. Um, I thought we were adding triadat, triadatic 
It is, it is an addition. In addition. So yeah. you could have individual, right. you can have triadic or, or group. Right. I think what his argument is, though, because agencies are yeah. fiscally conservative, to be polite, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> that they will always choose triadic over individual and no one will get individual. And that's gotcha. his concern. Uh, yeah. No, I could in, see that concern. In the uh, mills, right? In the way it's <laughs> written, it, it can replace individual supervision. Okay. So I, we. So when I did my research, um, uh, it is. It is true that there are some different outcomes, but what's interesting is the clinical outcomes weren't statistically significant, although those measurements are really hard to do in the first place, which is why I kind of pushed for this in the first place right. a year ago. Um, that yes, they probably could grow better from individual supervision, but with some of these other provisions that we're making that are more difficult, um, it gives the agency a little more resources, I guess, to mm -hmm. um, to provide supervision. Um, in terms of like showing videotapes or sessions or even talking about countertransference, my hope is that the culture of our profession is that we're growth oriented and that there's no shame having something to work on and so that the embarrassment hopefully wouldn't negatively impact. I mean, he makes good arguments mm -hmm. and is it significant enough of a difference to take this back off the table after arguing it for a year? I respect your opinion and I don't so this I'll be Diane devil devil's advocate here though, but I do think we also I don't think it's going to compromise it to an extent that we that it's going to be extremely harmful I think I think I would ask that we keep it in and my feeling is that um, I think we really discussed the implications with all the stakeholders for extensively and while there were some concerns I think that in balance there was more value to adding than to I'm in support of leaving it in too. Thank you for your comments. They are good arguments and, and I think we'll keep it in. All right, moving on, number 12, um, amount of individual supervision um, requiring the 52 weeks and then allowing it to be either individual or triadic. We've decided to move that from um, regulations to law. That was already done a while back. Uh, supervision in a group, item 13. Um, we allow um, currently group supervision to consist of up to eight supervisees. We've added an amendment that states the supervisor needs to ensure that the amount of supervision is appropriate for each supervisee. That's, that's an older addition. Um, item number 14, supervision in a non-private practice setting. We've made um, an amendment to require a written agreement when the setting um, is a non-private practice and the supervisor is not employed by the applicant's employ employer or as a volunteer. Um, previously, it was only if the if the supervisor was a, a volunteer. Now it's employer or volunteer. Um, based on discussion from the last meeting, um, we've amended the language a little bit to require the written agreement to contain an acknowledgement by the employer that the employer is aware the supervisor will need to provide clinical direction to the supervisee in order to ensure compliance with the standards and practices of the profession. I had something here, if I can find it. All right, on page 23, um, it really starts on 22 oversight of supervisees maximum number of registrants item D so um, on the third line uh, in no event shall any marriage and family therapy corporation employ at any one more than uh, any one time more than 15 individuals dot 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 um, I I thought in terms of employ does that include volunteers just when we're talking about employed versus volunteers I don't actually two different things because we're talking right number I just realized yeah. that 
Yeah, because this is a corporation <laughs> where the other um, is a um, is a non private practice. Non private practice, yeah. yeah. I don't know where this shows up then, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so your question was with on page 23. Third line. Third line. Um, no event shall any marriage and family therapy corporation employ. Does employee include volunteer is all the question, the only question I had. Um, that's a good question. Well, because it's talking about the 15 in interns, right? So they, they may not be, there are private practitioners who have, they give free supervision for the free labor. Whereas other ones say, I'll pay you a salary, but you have to pay me for supervision. Or I mean, there's so many different structures. So it's possible that the individuals, whether it's in an or, a corporation or an individual private practice who are volunteers. Um, we can look at that word and okay. kind of discuss with legal. Just if you would check that out. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so, but in terms of the idea of um, the problem with the computer, we were on, um, <laughs> we were on what number? number? We were on um, 14. 14, okay. There we um, go. I, I just couldn't turn the page. Nine. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we had talked about that some already. So I think that's good. Okay. Any comments from anyone? No. Okay. All right. Fifteen. The unprofessional conduct. Unless anybody wants to discuss it, we've discussed that at several of the past meetings. So I'm going to skip that one. Um, same with number sixteen. Um, we're deleting a lot of obsolete or double, double language. Um, the supervisory plan for LMFTs number 17, um, we've incorporated that into the supervision agreements. We're going to talk that, about that in a minute. Um, so I'm going to skip that for now. Um, as well as the annual assessment, we're requiring that in um, the supervision agree, um, agreement. So I'll, we'll discuss that in a minute. Um, number 19, the um, supervisor registration. Um, based on discussions um, from last time, we have decided, the committee has decided to require all supervisors to register with the board initiated by a licensed submission of a supervisor self-assessment report. Um, that's what the form is going to be called. Um, that report is going to be a form that they turn in. It lists the supervisor's qualifications and it uh, has them sign that they acknowledge certain responsibilities. Um, once that's done, the board is going, to, once that's turned in, the board will add a supervisor status to the licensee's record. Um, so basically on our database system, somebody would be able to go in there and see that they have a supervisor designation in there. Um, we are proposing to delay this, this um, till until January of 2020, just because we're in the process of, um, this is a big change, we've got to change a lot of forms, we're going to have to figure out how we want Breeze to be up, updated, we're going to have to um, put in the request to get that updated, there's a lot that has to happen until that can be done, um, and this legislation will probably move quicker than that can happen. Um, we have also, so beginning January 1, 2020, that's when we will require um, new supervisors to turn the, the um, supervisor self-assessment form in. Um, ex at that time, we will ask existing supervisors to turn it in by the end of March of 2020. So they have a little bit extra time. Um, and we have an attachment C, a draft of the supervisor self-assessment report. Good question, Steve. This is for you as our Breeze guru. So we run the legislation next year. We get lucky enough, it gets signed. Um, so that's 17. Um, we have to start working on the infrastructure beginning in 18. Is that going to be enough time to make the Breeze modifications for a, tw yeah, for the requirements to register and the modification in the Breeze system? Or uh, do we need more time? Implementing in 18? 20. 20. 2020 for oh. the register for the supervisors to register 
So right no, now that it's should almost be, no, 20, that should be. 2017, right? Okay. So yeah, if we get the lot, if it, it sails through and we get it signed, mm -hmm. um, everything comes into effect. Um, 2018. 18, 2018. And then from 2018 on, we'd have to hit the ground running to make the modifications and breathe. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I don't think it would be a problem for okay. that. I mean, that many, especially now there's, uh, with the uh, changes in how they're um, making, we're able to make changes and breeze with the uh, the way the department has structured that. So it's a little, it's, it's uh, dealing with more with the department than a vendor currently right now. So yeah, that's right. Fine. Okay. Yeah, I think it, it, it might be it's even a better position for us at that time too, to implement it. Okay, that's all I wanted. To sure. I'm feeling the heat from exam. <laughs> yes, I can appreciate that. Okay. Any questions or comments about? Um, those dates or the the structure of doing those two types of forms, breaking it down into the self-assessment form and the add. Yeah. I don't know if this is the right form or not, though. Um, the super. What am I looking at? Oh, we haven't talked about the supervision agreement yet, have we? Uh, right. No, yeah. That's not the next, next one. Yeah. Okay. So I'll yeah, hold my comment we'll till then. Should I move on? Let's okay. move on. Supervision agreement. Um, that would be another form, and that's a more extensive form that we've designed that the supervisor um, and the supervisee would need to work on together. So first step would be, as we just talked about, the supervisor would turn in the supervisor self-assessment report. That's a one-time thing. Once they're in the system, they're in the system. Um, they don't need to, to provide that to every supervisee. Um, am I correct, Christy? Right, and there's... Um, when Roseanne's talking about this, we've made some significant changes from the last meeting, so um, it's a little more of a streamlined form, but we'll get into why we did that. Um. So for the supervisor, um, during previous meetings, we decided that the supervisor responsibility statement that exists now would be um, replaced by the um, self-assessment report. Um, but we we decided and said we kind of reshuffled and we created the supervisor self-assessment report um, and put the responsibility statement into the supervisor supervision agreement correct yeah so the supervision agreement would be completed by both the supervisor and the supervisee um, it would include again the supervisor's license information and status and then an acknowledgement of super supervisor and supervisee responsibilities and um, that they would have to initial that they understood um, and then they would as part of this agreement they also are required to at that time work together to develop a supervisory plan um, and write out in the agreement the terms of that plan um, the original would then be retained by the supervisee and the supervisee would submit that f um, form to the board when they apply for licensure um, and we've got um, that agreement is an attachment D did you want to add in so well, I guess what I would just add is that so now the supervisor self-assessment report it would just be a streamlined just for the purpose of the, the supervisor registering with the board it would not be something they need to give a copy to their supervisee um, any longer because we're moving a lot of that content to the supervision agreement um, and the other reason we wanted to separate that out is we're going to have a delayed implementation on the self-assessment report because we're delaying um, but the super new supervision agreement with the supervisory plan would take effect earlier so that way it separates those two things and, and kind of helps with the flow I really like that the supervisee is not hurt if the self-assessment report is full of lies. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so the, the, if, um, if you've had a chance to look at the draft supervision agreement, um, it basically it's incorporates everything that was in the supervisor responsibility statement and then includes whatever this committee is proposing to add as far as supervisor responsibilities. And there's also a section for the supervisee to kind of initials um, that they understand certain of their responsibilities. Um, just some good reminders where we know that people lose hours because of certain issues and things like that. Um, and then again, the, the um, supervisory plan would also be part of that form, so all in one. I think you did excellent work on both the forms and in incorporating the vision and the comments of the staff and, and the committee and the stakeholders. Um, 
just following a phone call I had this week, I think it would be really important under the supervise, supervisee section to include a statement about um, they need to, they understand that they do not have a valid registration, meaning that it's current and active, that those hours are not count. They, they do not count. I thought that was in there. I didn't see it, but I could have overlooked it. But if that's not in there, I really think that that's important for the supervisee to sign or at least initial. And, that, and if we haven't caught it on the flip side of the supervisor, um, at some point where they have seen and verified that the individual has um, a valid registration. It, it is here, but it could be written a little more clearly. Okay. So uh, it's in the first one, but the it's kind of it's kind of muddy. So we, I'll work that out a little. I more. think it needs to really with this because this poor kid, a whole year of hours not happening. So and I was kind of surprised that the employer didn't catch it. Any comments on these two forms? One up. Um, I just wanted to say thank you. I think that's awesome that you're going to put that in and have the supervisee initial their responsibility because so much of this conversation is about the clinical supervisor's responsibility. But this is a dynamic process, and I think a lot gets lost for the supervisee being the learner, but they are also professional adults, and it is their experience, and Kim, your statement's so needed. Um, <laughs> and my understanding of the current regs is the responsibility for their experience is on them, not on the agency. So it needs to, the language needs to emphasize that. So thank you. That's awesome. Oh, I agree. I think we need to <laughs> transition to, let me lead you, lead you through this process to, you need to own it. You're at, at some point going to become a licensed professional and, and there has to be some accountability and ownership of what you're doing. Hi, Jeffrey Liebert. Um, this is more of a personal conversation, more because I just went through this experience getting licensed myself. Um, it may be important on the board's end to make a comment that the transition time, the, sorry, the time for your processing of the applications may increase um, because the old form was roughly two or three pages and this is now 10. Um, so if I were submitting my packet, it would be roughly 90 pages. Um, so something like that just may add to your time processing and people on my end may want to know that. No, this, no. This is more of a more kind of, of a audit. checks and balance. Audit. Yeah, of everybody. Yeah, the, in terms of, because um, when we get the apps, we're looking at your experience hours where they counted, uh, you know, did, where they earned the way they were supposed to be earned. So. On the self-assessment report, I just recommend that on question number thirteen, where you have a bunch of boxes to check, uh, um, approve supervisor designations. There's more than those four, so I'd recommend you just have another box and then list it. For example, Smith College has an excellent um, advanced uh, clinical supervisor certificate program that Thank you. Strong in Northern California. Yeah. Anything else? Great job on these, really. Mm -hmm. It was awesome. You, great job, Christy, then. <laughs> All right, let's move to the weekly log, 21. Okay, so for the weekly log, um, that pretty much the same process for the weekly log is now. It's, um, it's something that they're supposed to sign every week, um, and then at the end, um, they hold on to, if we ask for it, they turn it in. Um, and then moving on to the experience verification um, form, staff has become aware that current law does not explicitly specify that supervisors must sign off on experience hours at the completion of supervision. So now we're clarifying this in the regulations. So I just had a question about that. Is that like a separate form? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. The experience verification summarizes all the hours and then the weekly log is the supporting document to show the number of hours you're reporting. Okay. And it's a form that's on the BBS website. Okay, just wanted to make sure of that. Okay, so now that we have all these forms that we've, new forms that we've created, we had to come up with some timelines to sort of phase this in because the bill, um, when this, if this, everything goes smoothly and this bill runs next year, it would become effective January 1, 2018. But um, 
we have to come up with some timelines for when people would submit these. So the supervisor self-assessment report, first of all, we put that that needed to be completed within 60 days of commencing supervision. Um, so that's the timeline for that. Um, and then the effective date would be January 1, 2020 for all new supervisors. They would have to start doing that, doing that turning it into us, which we would then record in our system. Um, for existing supervisors, we gave them a little bit of a, a, a three month delay. They would need to have it submitted by March 31st, 2020. Um, the supervision agreement, um, because that's requiring that they um, complete a lot of information with their supervisee, we decided to propose that that be completed within 60 days of commencing supervision. That gives them two months to sit down and sort of work that out. Um, and then in terms of the initial 15 hour supervision training courses, um, we wanted to factor into that the fact that there may be an emergency and somebody might have to be a substitute supervisor. Um, so we s have proposed that that be completed within either two or four years prior to commencing supervision, depending on, um, I believe that depends on um, if it was a, a college level course or not, or CE, <coughs> or within 60 days after commencing supervision. So they would have um, two months to complete the course if they had to become a supervisor with, with little notice. I just wanna make sure on that, that timeline, <clears throat> I had to read it two or three times. So let's say they took a supervision course more than s four years ago. They just need to do the six hour CEU sort of um, refresher course, right? I, I think that's what we had talked about and I just wanted to clarify. Um, I don't think that's quite it. So if, okay, it says the 15 hour course, if it was taken from um, a government agency or a CE provider, it's good for two years. So they can, anytime in the past two years, they could have taken it. If it was from a accredited um, university, it could be taken within four years. And then if the super, um, if the supervisor has not supervised for at least two of the um, past five years immediately preceding any supervision, um, then they would need to take a six hour yeah, training okay. course. Yeah, thanks. That, okay. Any comments on the timelines? Yeah, please come on in. About the um, third dot down, the initial 15 hour supervision training class must be completed within either two or four years. I know you just mentioned that. Does that mean that if I took my 15 hour class 10 years ago, that every four years I have to take another 15 hour class? Um, it doesn't well, mean, you, it's once you're, as long as you keep supervising, it stays good. But if you stop supervising, um, you, you would have to take a six hour refresher. So it's a one time class. Um, and it, the two or the four years comes into play, how long ago before supervising did you take it? Does that make sense? So then if you, but if, if once it you makes take- Makes sense as you talk, but as it's written, I'm not too sure okay. it's clear. We can look at that and try to clarify it a little bit. Um, I wanna go back to, I think it was um, Olivia's comment um, regarding uh, those who who do this for a living and get your get your hours in is it is it realistic to say you could get a 15-hour course within 60 days I think it was Olivia that brought that up right that it was it's difficult or you should no you said you should right well so right now people do they <coughs> do do it it's so difficult. but and hers is a 30-hour course but um, the there are people who intend very clearly early on to do this so obviously it'll be easy for them because okay. they know that like at their agency their agency is saying man as soon as you hit that two-year mark I want you to start supervising so they could start getting that coursework before that date um, what's more difficult is like at the last minute they've got to transfer somebody over and with getting in it with 60 days today 
it's hard because there just isn't a lot out there. But I was talking to Dean on the side, and she said CalPIC is going to develop a course. I know AMPT has a course. I don't. How often is the AMPT course? Uh, no, the AMPT course is a longer weekend thing. But how, is it frequent? Okay, so the California Division will do one for California. Okay. So you'll get one going. Okay, and then CAMP. CAMP usually has one. I think that's How ongoing. Often, though? It's online and at conferences. Okay, so and I know that they do conferences twice a year. Okay. Okay, so that was just my concern was I wanted to make sure the timing. So I think because that. 2020 is the date that um, hopefully by then everyone will have the means so that 60 days wouldn't be unreasonable to get that in. All right, should we move on to number 24? All right, 24, the last item for this um, MFT section. Um, we've added, as we've discussed previously, a section that would allow uh, the board to audit supervisor's records to verify they meet the supervisor qualifications proposed, and that's, that's covering the class and the, um, um, the continuing education. Um, and so there's a section that's been added there. Um, the board would likely audit a supervisor during like a CE audit or if a complaint was received and we would likely use the supervisor self-assessment report that they had completed um, in that kind of an audit. And I noticed then on their um, every two year professional development of six hours that all, you move that all into one area to say that it needs to be um, documented, that all, all credit toward that needs to be documented. Yes. All right, I think we have finished item six. Um, so now we can move on to item seven, uh, same thing, discussion of possible recommendation regarding proposal supervision language amendments for licensed professional clinical counselors. So there are a few differences here. <coughs> so 59, so let me go over to that on my iPad. All right, I'm gonna, if, if there's no objections, I'm just gonna go to the differences that I've identified and if anybody else has anything they wanna point out or discuss specific to LPCCs, we can. That there's sounds not, good. There's not a lot of um, differences that have changed since the last meeting. Um, one thing is that um, the definition, um, item number seven on page 61, um, the definition of a clinical setting and community mental health setting. Um, there was an interest in amending the definition of community mental health setting due to some confusion about that term. Um, there, at the last meeting, the committee directed staff to clarify that the setting shall not be a private practice, period. We deleted all the language about ownership of the private practice um, because that language was causing co confusion and it wasn't really the point. Okay. That was good. Yep. That's been done. Um, Moving on to page 62, um, talking about direct supervisor um, contact. Um, so we um, have added, let me get to that page. We've added, uh, we've moved um, some discussion because there's a little bit of difference between LPCC law and LMFT law when it comes to trainees and how much supervision they need. Um, because LPCC trainees cannot count supervised experience. Right. So there's no discussion about whether or not they're under their counting hours or not. So we moved the, the, the part that talks about clinical counselor trainees receiving um, experience up to the top because it doesn't belong under the discussion of gaining experience. Um, I just want to make sure, and I think that, that it works well there, um, the committee might want to discuss, and that it's on page 77, it's um, part A under 4999.46.2. We're only specifying um, that a clinical counselor or trainee um, needs direct supervisor contact for every five hours of direct clinical counseling that it's performed. We're not saying anything about um, non clinical. Um, services nor do we need to okay. I just wanted to make sure of that <laughs> yeah. okay 
because we don't do that for the other two professions, so it's it's unnecessary. Yep. And, okay. and usually the hard hours to get are the clinical ones anyway. Okay. So um, on that page, mm -hmm. uh, or actually on the next page, because this doesn't fit in any of the other items, I just had a qu question on the top of page 78, and it may just be stupid, H, um, six hours of supervision that may be credited during any single week pursuant to paragraph two, subsection A, whatever, shall apply to supervision hours gained on or after January 1st, 2009. I'm assuming this was copied over from the MFT language because there were no LPCCs in 2009. Right, it's copied over and it's just because um, it, we could go back to the start date of LPCCs, but we'd have to identify it exactly. When we put in place the five hours to six hours, the law is not retroactive unless we specifically say that it is. Okay. So it's not hurting anything to say it's going back to 2009. Okay, it's um, just weird. It is weird, <laughs> and I acknowledge that it'll go away when, when, that, when those six years phase out. Okay. But for now, we need to have it in there otherwise it could hurt Fine. somebody adversely. Okay, thank you. Back to page 62, was there anything else on that? That's all I have. Okay, um, so let's go ahead. Any questions, um, comments? No, so can we move? That on? is all that, though those are the main differences between the LPCC and the LMFT that have changed since the last meeting, so I guess, any other comments we could take those I just have some edits uh, on the language uh, which I can talk with staff afterward I don't think it, the co whole committee needs okay that sounds good thanks Dean all right so then those are the only differences between the MFT and LPCC mm -hmm. so we can move on to item number eight for the clinical social workers and change 105 okay um, so the I've identified two major now the L LCSW law is is somewhat different than the other two because it was not modeled after MFT law um, but there are a couple of key differences that, that we are a couple of key changes that we've made since the last meeting or things we need to discuss I've identified two um, one thing is that um, at the request of the stakeholders, um, we've reduced the amount of supervised experience hours required for the LCSW license um, from 3,200 hours down to 3,000 hours. Um, the maximum for the non-clinical category would be reduced from 1,200 hours to 1,000 hours. Um, and the purpose of this is to put California um, in line with other states and also have some parity between the LCSWs and the LMFTs and LPCCs um, because they are only required to have 3,000 hours. Any questions or comments? Lots of shaking of heads of, yeah, that's good. <laughs> All right, moving on. Um, the other thing that we've identified that we would like to discuss um, is on page uh, 109. Um, it's item 15 starts on page 108, but it's item G. Um, and this is a change that we've made for, for LCSWs, but we wanna discuss it a little bit in the context of LCSWs being a little bit different for this. Um, the discussion surrounds employment, supervision, and work settings. Um, and so currently for our other license types, um, in a private practice setting, an associate supervisor must be one of the following. They either need to be an owner or shareholder of the private practice, or they need to be employed by the private practice and practice at the same site as the associate's employer. So we've added that language. That's, that requirement currently wasn't in LCSW law. So we added it to LCSW law to make it consistent with the other professions. However, one thing that's different with LCSWs is that um, they have a special requirement that an ASW must obtain 1,700 hours under a specifically an LCSW. Um, and so sometimes in a large agency, um, in order to keep their ASW, like uh, if they have an ASW on staff and they might have an MFT that supervises them. Um, and so sometimes in order to keep their ASW, they might, um, contract with an LCSW supervisor 
once their ASW has exhausted the hours they can gain under an LMFT or an LPCC. Um, if the item in item G was adopted, that might become more difficult because they couldn't contract anymore. Um, a private practice. Private practice. So it's not necessarily the end of the, you know, they could go find another job and a lot of times supervisees have multiple settings that they work in, um, but it would stop that practice. So we just wanted to get some feedback on how everybody felt about that. So the mask and the social workers, mostly, but MFTs are welcome to come too, of course. <laughs> um, so I, I can't speak necessarily to what he's going to talk about, but one of the questions that comes up in the supervision workshops I teach is, how defined is site? Is it within the same suite of offices? Is it the same building? <laughs> That's a good question. corporation and you have multiple suites I would say that would be one employer as opposed I don't know if that answers your question but that's that's the just at first glance that's how I would approach it who where are they receiving payment Dick Rogers member of the law and ethics committee of the society um, I would guess that less than 1% of ASWs get their hours in a private practice setting. And I think the clinical society, certainly our law and ethics committee, would strongly and ethically consider social work or advise social workers not to do so. Anything that makes it harder to get hours in a private practice setting, the clinical society would be all for it. I don't think it's really the ideal situation. Therapist. And people are often grossly taken advantage of you know we we don't oppose anything that makes it harder for ASWs to get thank you so one of my logics when I read this was we established this limitation for the other two professions because it was for the safety of the <coughs> consumer and whether it's convenient or inconvenient to the person collecting hours, to the supervisee, in this case should be irrelevant because if, it, if the consumers need to be protected from MFTs and LPCs, they need to be protected from social workers as well. So that, I, I couldn't see good logic for that inconsistency. Yes, someone will be annoyed by this, someone will be unhappy, but if we think the consumers need to be protected in the other professions, then this one should be no different. Okay, so it looks like we're okay with keeping that language. I, I wanna hang on a second. Angelique's reading it. Are, do you need a minute? About sight. You want us to hang on a second? No, keep going. All right, let us know if you find something there for us to talk about more thanks all right what else um, I th that's all that I have for social workers okay so the only comment I have in um, uh, on page 129 and 135 um, we in all the other in the other two professions we put applicant for licensure and we didn't write it um, on those two pages. Um, so page 129 at the bottom under G, on page 135, 8A, um, we just put applicant instead of applicant for licensure. On 135, 8A? 8A. I don't know if that should be there, but. I will um, double check that and see. Page 129 at the bottom, item G. There are some cases when we need to refer to it as an applicant still because um, it could it could refer need to refer to somebody who's just graduated and hasn't. Got it. But but there are certain cases where it needs to be. So I will double check those. Okay. Thank you. All right. So is there anything else on the social work language uh, that we need to discuss? Yeah. Please.
Rogers again. I just want to, now that we're specifically talking about uh, clinical social workers, I want to strongly encourage you to look at the triadic supervision. I don't think it helps um, become a good clinical social worker if that is the only kind of supervision you have, the triadic supervision and groups. Um, maybe you could add in the law that those hours that are required by LCSWs are one-to-one -one because that's where your identity as a clinical social worker often happens is in the supervision clinical social work supervisor. Um, and that might be a way to work around both issues. Where I, other professions, I'd be very sad to find out that, I mean, I, I hear that you guys are looking at the outcomes of the psychotherapy process, but as a supervisor, I'm responsible for the outcomes of the growth and the learning and the development of my supervisee. I think the research is pretty clear that group supervision and triadic supervision provide the same strengths and have the same challenges and individual supervision is where a lot of rich strengths, and I wouldn't want to cut down on that. So at least for the clinical social workers, at least within those hours that are provided by clinical social workers, I'd prefer they not be provided in triadic supervision. Thank you. Duly noted. Are we ready to move on to item nine? Discussion and possible recommendation regarding submission of 1099 documentation. Okay, so as we've talked about a little bit, um, the uh, applicants have to have been a W-2 employee or a volunteer while they're gaining experience, and actually it'll be gaining experience or performing services. Um, and so what happens, some, so they have to submit a W-2 or a letter verifying that they were a volunteer, one of the two, um, but sometimes people tr will turn in a 1099, which indicates to us, oh, you, you were an independent contractor, but sometimes, and the law includes a provision for this in LMFT and LPCC law, that if the applicant can demonstrate the 1099 was solely for reimbursement of their own costs, such as for travel, that that would be acceptable. Um, so in that case, they would have been a volunteer um, and gotten the 1099 for reimbursement. Um, so the, the, the law puts a figure of $500 a month as a limit, and that's been in the law for as many years as I can remember, which is a long time. Um, and so looking at that figure of 500 a month, we felt that regardless of how much somebody's reimbursed, basically what we're going to do is ask for documentation that these were this was reimbursement for actual expenses. So the, the dollar amount... Um, is not the critical point here because dollar amounts over time become less meaningful because the cost of living changes. So um, what we basically want to do is we want to add this to the LCSW law and take out the 500 a month and just that way. So um, I think that's a great idea because the cost of living is constantly going to change and you're going to ask for documentation anyway, so the amount almost doesn't. Well, and this will include the stipends that we see too, won't it? When they submit 1099s for. Um, I don't think this addresses the stipends. But that's something we can look into. Well, when they submit the 1099, the stipends usually listed. Maybe they got $1,200. It's not necessarily reimbursement for expenses, but it might be a stipend that was awarded. So, um, and that's the only mechanism that the entity has to track the award of that money. So I think it. My first glance, and we can defer to legal, but I think that this covers that because we're going to ask them to document what the 1099 was issued for. But a stip is, is a stipend for reimbursement, or is it that? It's just a stipend for working. So we, for, for example, we offer stipends for our students who are bilingual in Spanish That's to right. work with the Spanish-speaking population because there's so much competition for them. There are certain agencies that offer a stipend to entice them. That's what I thought. So I think this language does not address stipends, but we can, that needs to be addressed because I know that's, that's more and more often that they're offering those stipends for, to bring people into the profession that are really needed. I, I see it frequently with LCSW applicants. And we talked about it. So I, I don't know. Well, let's, it's, if this language covers it, then I'm good. It wouldn't because it says um, receiving, the board may audit applicants who receive reimbursement for expenses. They have to demonstrate that they were for reimbursement of expenses. <laughs> we need to add something about stipends okay. probably. And I don't know if we would need to set an amount 
we might need to discuss what would be appropriate in that case okay because yeah, then where, then where do you draw the line? I mean, reimbursement for expenses is one thing because if you live in San Francisco, your expenses are going to be higher than if you live in like a rural area. But a stipend, that's kind of a different thing. And that will be difficult to assess. So I know, for example, um, the MFT consortium, uh, students can apply for county stipends of eighteen thousand five hundred dollars mm -hmm. and then they get a job doing their internship working at a county agency so I'm not sure how you're gonna address that and then at the trainee level at the university level um, I've seen stipends range from five hundred to two thousand for the year mm -hmm. so I know this the stipends are, do not come from the employer right they come from um, they come from outside entities, right? So that's so okay. So I believe because it's not coming from the employer that, um, but it could. It, it could. could come from it, the it employer. It could come that's from the employer. Dig into this a little more and yeah, because I don't want to. I don't want to unfairly penalize yeah. someone who got that award um, simply because there was no other mechanism to track it other than a 1099. If somebody got a stipend, would they get? Would they be able to prove that it was a stipend? Uh, they would have I, a letter, probably. So a letter. maybe mm -hmm. we just say if if they get a 1099 for a stipend, then they need, they need to prove that that it was That's actually what, for yeah. a stipend, not. Well, we but, can but ask Darlene because be. she sits on the Sacramento committee. <laughs> well, and but I'm also thinking like that could falsely be done too. That somebody could just make up a letter. I'll, let's hear what Darlene has to say. <laughs> yeah, hi, Darlene Davis. I'm also the MFT stipend coordinator for um, Sacramento area and go to the consortium meetings. So I heard you say, Christy, that sometimes people will send in proof of a stipend and that means there were a volunteer and that's not necessarily true for these types of stipends, whether they're through the county or the state. Um, they can be an employee or they can be a volunteer and receive a stipend. We don't report that to the IRS. We don't give them anything. Um, we don't give them a 1099 that says we gave them this money. Um, as far as I know, that we don't. We tell them in the contract that we don't. It's up to them to let the IRS know what this money was for because it's really supposed to be used for reimbursement of educational costs and whatever that means to that person. So it's not really part of their job, but the commitment that they give is they work in public, mental, or behavioral health. So Kim, are you still seeing though? I, I still see people submit a 1099 and they say, oh, it was a stipend. Okay, and so some. So they, they, I think it's a loose too. term. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's a loose term. So maybe yeah. we need to look into that a little bit more because I'm completely comfortable with, you know, an award from an agency because they want to offset some of the costs. I'm totally comfortable, but what I want to um, be able to clearly identify um, are those entities that are, are using the associates and the interns as an independent contractor and they're paying them through the 1099, yeah. and which you can't do. So. Um, that's what, and I don't know if we can address, I think this probably is fine for our purposes and maybe we circle back and we, in another committee to look. Let's go to like policy and advocacy, yeah. that's what I was going to I mean, I'm thinking we might need to do that because I see a number of social workers, they use, um, they get placed um, in a correctional facility through a temp agency or an employment agency and the employment agency issues them the 1099. And then we're looking at it going, you know, that's $40,000. That's clearly a little more than a stipend. What's going on? You're clearly an employee somewhere. And they'll, oh, no, I'm, they put me here. So now they're an independent contractor. So it, then it becomes this balancing act that, you know, am I an employee, volunteer so I can get my hours or am I an employee? So, yeah. It's an employment attorney. Yes, it is. Problem. I don't think we could solve that yes. here. So that's Thank what you. we, yeah, that's. <laughs> A frequent problem. Okay, so that we will leave that for further discussion on a f on probably the policy and advocacy mm -hmm. committee. All right. Uh, moving on to um, item ten: discussion and possible recommendation regarding draft supervision brochure. 
for um, all three professions because you have it there. For yeah, I went ahead and included it for all three because there are some really slight differences. But um, so the committee's seen this at one point, and then we asked some stakeholders for feedback, and so. The changes are indicated in red, but the changes from the prior meeting to now is in green. Um, and so it's basically just, um, it's, it's a document that um, we currently have on our website. Um, we would put these revisions in as soon as the other provisions take effect. Um, we originally um, had proposed requiring the, that supervisors provide this to their supervisees. But the, the tricky part about that is if we do that, we have to incorporate the content of the brochure into the law, actual law. So if we ever wanted to change the brochure, it requires a law change, which um, is, it makes things difficult and less, much less flexible. So what we are proposing is that we include a statement on the new supervision agreement that just recommends the supervisee download the brochure and discuss it with his or her supervisor. So it becomes something we recommend but not require. Um, is there anything? That, yeah, that, those were the main things about it. So there, um, you know, and any other feedback that people have on the content, um, be happy to hear about that. Um, the only question I had, is there somewhere in here also to say that if your supervisor's license is not active or if your supervisor's on probation, um, those hours don't count yes <laughs> yeah I, I thought I saw it on here but I, I can't find it now it is here. Okay. Well, on the one brochure I think it's the uh, MFT brochure on page 158 it talks about your supervisor's license status okay good I actually I'm not sure it addresses the supervisor on probation but let me I'll make a note of that um, we can't say that enough because there's nothing like losing one to two years of experience because your supervisor didn't renew yeah I think that would Add. Any comments or questions about the brochures? So um, I would also agree to not put it into law and require it, um, especially because even updating a link, which could happen very frequently. I, I actually asked the uh, Office of Administrative Law, if we incorporated this, it has links. And so basically, if the con if the it, as long as the, what it's linking to doesn't it provide any requirements. So if, if you have a link, it goes to an informational page. It's not giving you any additional requirements, that that's okay. Um, but if the link is sending you to somewhere that has some requirements, then anyway, I got a technical legal explanation that makes, yeah, that makes yeah. some sense. So we want to keep it out of the law. Right. Yeah. So, so do we just advertise this like crazy? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's yeah, exactly. like some of the other brochures we used to have. Okay. Yeah. Um, when, so this kind of putting the cart before the horse, but um, when we register supervisors in 2019 or whenever that is, um, are they going to be doing that online or they're going to fill out a form and mail it in? It will be on, uh, available either, both ways. Okay. Because my thought is when they mail it in, um, you could have like a little pop-up, like thank you for submitting your application and don't forget to um, let your supervisees know about this brochure or, you know, it's like something there just as a, to help them remember, I don't know. Well, what happens too is what we do is when they do the outreach, um, this would be part of the, the paraphernalia that we take down to the outreach to the association events, the school events. Um, because we take application packets with us. It's not any, and those graduates are going to be wanting to know about supervision here. Here's a guide to it. Take a moment to read it. So, I mean, we can get it out there. Um, I think it's nice that the supervisor knows what they're supposed to be doing, but, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I hesitate to, when we get something, to, to, you know, mail something back out to the supervisor. No, I wouldn't mail yeah. it out. I was just, I would say. Like a pop-up. Yeah, just a pop-up. Don't forget that we have a brochure for your supervisees if they want it. I'm not sure we have the capability for that kind of a pop-up okay. kind of thing. <laughs> it, would be, it would be nice, but yeah, I'm okay. not sure. Yeah. But right. we'll, we'll be thinking just... of different ways to get it out, you know, right. get it out there. Thanks. Hi, I'm Mick Rogers. I have a very broad comment. Um, 
in the brochure under the section of preparing for the licensing examinations, I'm concerned there's too much emphasis in the brochure on that. When you're supervising somebody in the last six months of their 3,200 hours, or I guess now 3,000 hours, they begin to resist, uh, everybody begins to resist closure and saying goodbye. So they transition to, I'm just going to focus now on preparing for this exam. Um, I'd hate for the brochure to, to further that resistance. I'd much rather clinical supervision go for the entire two years. Um, so sure, it should be mentioned that it's the uh, supervisor's responsibility to help you with figuring out what to do with the exam, but it's really not the primary purpose of clinical supervision in those last several months. It's one of the things you do as a clinical supervisor. So I'm just looking at it, my sense is we're telling the associates uh, your supervisor should sort of change gears at the end and work on helping you pass your exam. Um, it's their responsibility to follow through on finding resources and preparing for their exam. Supervisor's responsibility to protect consumers and make sure that their uh, associate is growing into a better practitioner. Um, so I, I don't have specific wording. I'm just saying, it's, just looking at it, that was my first impression. It was like, this is too much on, and I could see <laughs> some supervisees I've had in the past making use of it as, uh, aha, your job is to help me pass my exam. And it's so not. I, for me, I wasn't thinking that this document was the supervisor's responsibility to the supervisee. It was the re supervisee's responsibility for their own supervision. And the piece around the exam, just in the last week, I've gotten three emails from random people, I guess because I sit on the board, um, who said, uh, my intern number expires, I need to renew. Do I have to take the law and ethics exam before I can renew? Um, and I, so the, I, my assumption was that this was on there so we could reduce the number of phone calls, emails about exam information, that this would just give them an additional resource that they could dig through. That being said, I think we can maybe tweak this language a little bit, like that first sentence. Um, effective clinical supervision should help prepare you to pass the licensing exams. I think we could maybe make that a little bit softer. Maybe as effective clinical supervision. Um, prepares you to pass the clinical exam. It, yeah, prepares or as part of your entire experience or something. I had the words and then they flew out. Um, but yeah, I, I think that because when I get calls about how do I prepare for the exam, I mean, we typically stress, look at what's on the website. We right. typically stress um, what you learned in school. We typically stress what what you do in your day-to-day -day, um, delivery of services and, and have those conversations with your supervisor. I, I, I have supervisees who spend a fortune on these classes that prepare, and they get really good feedback of you're, you're strong in this area, you're weak in that area, they make flashcards. And as you approach the end of supervision, it's a real relationship, and people, right. people don't want to say goodbye. So instead, they want you to review their flashcards. And I'm not their mom on the kitchen table going yeah. over history test questions. And I, so I just don't want anything that gives the impression that no, that's I, my role. I, I, yeah, I think we could soften it. I, I do. But yeah, it's part of the package of preparing for that clinical exam, because those questions are more clinically related. Thank you very much. Okay, so you'll look at that and soften that language. All right. I just want to echo the statements um, that he said, but I, I envision that there's a number of supervisors who work in settings that aren't going to be comprehensive enough to address either of the exams. Um, that I, I also serve as a subject matter expert for the BBS, so having written and reviewed questions, even my own supervisory experience doesn't expand to all areas of what's um, within those examinations. Plus, for supervisors who were taking their own tests during the orals, the exams have undergone so many changes that to, in addition to everything else that's being required of the supervisors, um, to understand the intricacies for something that has changed so much during their careers. I'd also like to see a major softening of the exam. Thank you. Now that we're coming to the end of the agenda, I'd just like to take this opportunity to say, we've, this committee has been meeting for three years now. Been three years? Yeah, I have agendas from 2014. 
and we've had a lot of input, a lot of disparate ideas, and I really have to recognize the patience of the committee to be, and particularly Leah uh, as the chair, as we've sorted through all of these ideas that have come, in thro come through, and then hats off to the staff, to Roseanne and Christy for putting all these ideas into law that, that can actually be uh, implemented. So thank you, all of you. Thank you. We do have one more agenda item. I, 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 I kind of wanted to temporary substitution of a supervisor. I, I just want to yeah. go back to what Kurt had said really rang a bell because my when I worked in the exam unit um, I know a lot of the time you would have people who had trouble pla passing the clinical vignette well then you talk to the candidate sometimes and they only ever work for CPS. Right, and that doesn't necessarily prepare you. So sometimes we would say, you know, it's good to get experience in a variety of settings and in clinical work. So I'm almost wondering. Well, what, maybe what you do is you don't tie it to the supervisor at all. You just have an area of exam information. Oh, which I think this is trying to do, but um, just have no language about supervisor. Right. Yeah. So maybe because this is a guide to supervision. Um, Maybe just stick it at the end. Yeah, some, somewhere <laughs> maybe if, if you guys feel that's appropriate. Um, I think it's helpful for people to know that one work setting may not adequately prepare you. So, okay. Yeah, I do like the suggestion of looking at the candidate handbook because that's where you'll get the content areas that where we're testing. So it's good to look at that. Maybe you call a section after supervision or at the end of your supervision. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I think we can we can work or this out. Or just call the section call, uh, preparing for your exam, Damn. and yeah. then take everything related to your supervisor out of that. Okay, mm -hmm. that sounds okay. All right, you ready to move on to item eleven? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Okay, so this is on um, temporary substitute supervisors. Um, we talked about this a little bit at the last meeting and it occasionally happens um, where the regular supervisor is not available. It may happen with or without warning. Um, and there was some general agreement about a few points and we were talking about this is that having a substitute supervisor should not be too difficult of a process but should still provide the important safeguards. Um, that any substitute supervisor would need to meet all of the required qualifications of a supervisor. Um, and that they should sign a supervisor responsibility statement. So now it would be the supervision agreement um, and the weekly log. And then if the substitute supervisor would be um, doing this for a short period of time, so the one timeline that was brought up is if it was 30 days or less, creating a new supervisory plan would not be necessary because you're setting goals and objectives and it's for such a short period and you already have one in place with your regular supervisor. So, um, so we, that would not come into play and then same thing if it's 30 days or less um, they wouldn't need to sign a separate experience verification form the, the regular supervisor would just sign off on those although the weekly logs will show the the substitute person um, and we didn't discuss whether a new letter of agreement would be necessary when the substitute supervisor was not employed by the supervisee's employer so that's the one piece um, so basically do these, uh, does it make sense to have the supervisor meet all the required qualifications, sign the supervision agreement and the weekly log, and then the 30 days or less, no need for a supervisory plan or no need to sign an experience verification. So does that, step one, does that make sense? Well, one, one question is also 30 days. So right, exactly. we'll, we'll get to the 30 days in a minute. Okay. Um, so it makes sense to me that they wouldn't, for a short period of time, whatever we define that to be, that um, they do need an agreement, right, saying that they've met the requirements and that they're registered as a supervisor um, or acknowledged with the board. And then, of course, they'll sign the weekly log. That makes sense to me. Um, I agree that we don't need a new plan. And then what was the last form again? The uh, experience verification, signing off on hours. So that's the final form. That's the final one when you're done. So the difficulty is what if it's the last 30 days and the supervisor died? Maybe they could, they don't have to. We're, there's a different, 
if the supervisor died or is incapacitated, we actually have a separate section on that, and we can okay. take a look and see how the two interplay just to be sure. Um, so, uh, yeah, I would say if it's in the middle, no, they wouldn't need to sign that. They just need to sign that weekly. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and then you had also said something about do they, if they're not employed by or they need to establish a relationship with that agency. So that's another question. Like if it's the small amount of time, right. do they need to have a relationship? I think they do. Um, because it, let's say we use 30 days, four sessions with a client, they, sh they may want to look at the files. They may want to. So I kind of think that one they may need to have. And my assumption would be the agency already has the documentation for the other person. They just recreate it. And, and um, from an earlier recommendation that we write a sample contract, mm -hmm. Um, they can simply download that, and if it's, you know, hopefully it won't be nine pages, it won't be that onerous. So if it's just a couple pages, then it, it seems for the protection of the supervisor and supervisee that maybe they do need to sign uh, something if they don't already have a, an existing relationship. So then, uh, any, before we get on to 30 days or not, any questions or comments on that piece from anyone? No. Okay. All right. So then magic number 30 days. <laughs> Just pull it out of our hats. Um, well, so my question is for the people who work in agencies. You're the ones that have to answer this. Um, what is, when people are, usually my assumption is if somebody is just filling in, typically it's a week or two. Mm -hmm. um, so 30 days is a very generous offer. Is there a need to make that bigger or smaller? You guys can arm wrestle about who goes first. <laughs> I work for a agency that does uh, counseling in schools so the agency year um, typically goes from September through June if I have a conflict in November and a conflict in May and I have the same substitute supervisor how does 30 days fit it would be maybe 30 consecutive days that's it's a good point yeah yeah anyone so any consecutive 30-day period um, and do we uh, like do we mean 30 business days or 30 actual day? I mean, do you, I don't know if you have to specify that. Only if it's business days, if it's just okay. 30 days. If no. 30 days is 30 days. Consecutive then. Mm -hmm. Thank you, that's good clarity. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Darlene Davis, does that help, Leah, what you were asking? Because I was thinking 30 days can be spread out throughout the year. So typically, yes, I'm only gone for one week at a time if I am gone but I might be gone four times in that year, so it would be 30 days. It, it could end up being 30 days that they work but it, it could end up being 45, but if it's 30 consecutive days, like I would rather a supervisor who is the substitute supervisor yeah. come in and they do a week here and a week there, and right. week, I don't have issue with that uh, because you may not be, yeah, I, I, I think that's, okay i think it's the 30 consecutive yeah it's the 30 consecutive days it seems like more than 30 days is a really long time so you're okay with 30 consecutive days yes mm -hmm. in a year in a year okay because some of the larger agencies or even smaller agencies if a supervisor leaves for some unknown reason right it could be could take them more than 30 days to find another supervisor but i'm okay with at that time they sign uh, all the paperwork for the supervisee yeah I think 30 consecutive days is a good number I wouldn't go less than that yeah because the, the more than 30 days would typically be like a medical leave of absence or something like right. that yeah. and then then they do need the paperwork but I really appreciate that you're adding this because in the school setting I teach also there's a lot of paperwork that has to be turned in from the supervisee for every single supervisor that they have and so if there's a substitute supervisor 
for a week or two, it's nice that they don't have to now have five, lo you know, university logs. Yeah, because and and supervisors need vacations too. Right. <laughs> In fact, I'm going next week. Yeah. <laughs> Leah, I have a, I have a comment or question. Um, yeah, and I think the idea of having it 30 consecutive days doesn't preclude somebody from doing it a week here, a week there, filling in, right? And I think that's kind of what you're getting at, is having somebody on site that could do that. I did, as I was reading this as a, you know, a lay person kind of thing, the, um, it, it's just always the last thing is, you know, okay, what if I go over 30 days? What if it happens? I think we should have something in there that, just a statement about if you exceed this if it exceeds 30 consecutive days, the need for a supervisor exceeds 30 consecutive days, then you need to go back through the process of getting a supervisor or describe whatever. All the paperwork? Just, I don't know. Is that what you want to do? I don't, I don't know how you want to direct somebody, but that is inevitably going to come up. Yeah. So will you guys work on language for that? Yeah, I know our licensees, the, the registrants, they'll go, well, what happens if? Uh -huh. that, that'll be the next one. They always do. So, no, it's a good point. Uh, Jerry Shapiro, San Francisco State. Um, maybe one place to really anchor this is in the supervisory plan. Because if the organizing principle is really to come up with a vision of how to provide continuity of clinical experience for the client, then maybe some specification in that plan around contingencies. And then maybe the language here could refer back as specified or characterized in the supervisory plan. And that allows for there being some anchored reference point without necessarily being caught up with counting the number of days. It really needs to be integrated in, as does termination, for example, in the supervisory plan. Thank you. So some language about continuity of, so in other words, would it be that the substitute supervisor agrees to follow the supervisory plan that's already been established? Is that where this? Well, and, and that the intention behind the supervisory plan is to provide a certain, I want to say continuity of care. <laughs> I mean, it's continuity of supervision is probably the right way to language that. Um, Can just you? sort of as a beginning provision of, of the actual document. Of the supervisory plan document? Yes. Or? Yeah, the supervisory plan document is like that the purpose and intention of this document is so that there's a continuity of, of supervision. So you were asking, Leah, about whether it needs, everything needs to be redone, all the paperwork, but I mean, maybe we need to say something to the effect of you can adopt or adapt the existing plan and make it simpler. You know, if, they, if, they ha if they're in this situation, that's going to be very stressful for a supervisee, right, to find somebody. And I think um, and we don't want to compromise care by that. So I don't know. I'm just thinking of trying to make it easier to get, to get somebody on board. Do you understand what I'm saying? No. Okay. <laughs> that they use the supervisor plan that's kind of been in place already and that the emergency supervisor just, or whoever they get to. Continue to follow that yeah, plan. That, yeah, that's what you're saying. But that's also, yeah. Yeah, so just stating that. So. Yeah. Sorry, I wasn't clear. Okay. So that, that it's also, that the purpose of the plan is to provide a continuity of supervision and that in the case of a um, temporary sup supervisor, whatever you're calling it, that fills in, that they would continue on that same plan okay so that needs so we would put something like that in the language but on the actual supervisory plan form is that something that needs to be addressed or we're not talking about that here well, I think Jerry was suggesting on the actual form the actual to make form. it really clear to everybody what the purpose is it's, well the purpose right now is setting goals and objectives for the supervisee right so I'm trying to think so and the then temporary supervisor needs to follow that so the form is back on, if you go to agenda item six, and then toward the back, um, just before the number seven tab. So it would be um, nine. Actually, the supervisory plan starts a little later, um, page 56 and 57.
So is the intent to have the temporary supervisor agreement in the initial supervisor planned? Is that the, what's, uh, no. no? The intent is that the temporary supervisor look at the plan to know what they're supposed to be doing. So then we're just looking for language to put in this current proposed language requiring them to look at it. Well, I wasn't, think, I don't, I wasn't thinking of it this what, that way. I was thinking that this plan would be, you know, clarified that it's for continuity of supervision. But yeah, it would, then it would make sense to go back and maybe put language here in this part to say that they are responsible for being familiar with the supervisory plan. How does that work in practice? Like when you go on vacation, what well, happens? I'm thinking it's the supervisee's responsibility because okay. um, it might be more difficult for the substitute supervisor to figure out a way to get access it, access it from me. That's a good idea. But the supervisee is going to be with them. So it's their responsibility to bring that in. This is what I've been working on. This is where we're at yeah. on the plan. I like that. Yeah. yeah, I like that. Yeah. So maybe we can make it the supervisee's responsibility to inform the temporary supervisor. Those, the so they pro would provide them with a copy of the existing supervisory plan? Mm -hmm. they, they, they should have it yeah. already. They should have it, yeah. It's a, it's a they're gonna have to turn a it living in. document. They're going to have to turn it in at the end. Exactly, so. exactly. Yeah. That, that really solves that. Thank you. Any other discussion on that? Hey, are there, I guess that we've rearranged things, so <laughs> <laughs> there are no other items. Um, before we go, I uh, want to reiterate what Dean said about the hard work of staff, and particularly Roseanne and, and Christy working so hard on the language and doing the enormous amount of research that you have done for this committee. You guys have um, definitely earned your keep. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you've done really outstanding work. Thank you so much. And um, this has been a, a fun committee and it's uh, nice to think that we might have done something. We'll find out. <laughs> in November how much we've actually done. But, and I also want to thank all the, um, um, I was going to say constituents, isn't that funny? Stakeholders, thank you, um, for your participation. Like many of you have come to just about or every single one of these meetings and your feedback and input has been priceless. This couldn't be done without you. So thank you all very much for, for coming and taking the time to do this. Yeah, that's crazy. Three that years. Nice <laughs> <laughs> we call that boomerang. <laughs> All right, in that case, okay. then we can adjourn the meeting. It's 11.39. Thank you, well, everyone. Oh, sorry. Before we adjourn, can we make sure that there's no more public comment on the specific public items comment, and yeah. agenda since we didn't offer them after each item? Oh, okay. Thank you. Any public comment or? On items on the agenda. Thank you. That being said, then we'll adjourn the meeting. Thank you so much. And the board meeting will begin at 1.